and let us all that we can to build a better future. Well, there's Tom and Jerry. There's, you know, the three stooges, you know, great people who, 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 who come together, work together. You got, uh, you know, Batman and Robin, you know, you got, you got, you got, you got, you got, you got duos or triple teams, you know, working together. Who, who, who would ever think one day we would see a collaboration between two people that have nothing in common, but everything in common. Greta met with Zelensky. That's right. Everybody's favorite environmentalist. How dare you? How dare you? Met with Zelensky. Now, for those of you who don't know, Greta has always been a loud, vocal voice trying to end pollution and call out climate change. But see, the thing is, one of the biggest contributors to, you know, industrial pollution and so much more is uh, the military industrial complex. So again, I just have to wonder, like, Greta, why are you there? It doesn't even look like you want to be there. So here, this is this this is probably one of the most awkward meetups ever. Hi. It's really a very important signal uh, for uh, of uh, supporting Ukraine. It's it's very important and and uh, really we need. Need your help, your professional help. And What's Greta going to do? Professional help for what? Or any of those people going to do? I spoke with my team. We had a good conversation. I thank you very much for, for video format, uh, w which we had together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it, it, it's very important to have, have, to have this. Uh, you made the decision about this compact of uh, very concrete steps. We've been there in Kherson region, in Mykolaiv region, and uh, a lot of cities, I think. So why am I talking about this? Well, because in a world of insanity and madness, we need real people to step up and really talk about the madness of this war in Ukraine, okay? Now, I've said this before on the show, and I'm going to keep on saying it. Before the war started, our oh-so-fantastic politicians, both Democrat and Republican, could have stopped it before the war happened. But what were they doing? Were they, A, formulating uh, important councils and meetings so they could uh, send out diplomatic envoys to make sure a conflict doesn't happen? Or B, calling their brokers and people who run their accounts so they can invest into the military industrial complex and make a huge financial killing in 2022, which is what they did. Please follow Unusual Whales on Twitter and you'll find out what your fantastic U.S. representative or U.S. senator has made, especially in regards to the oh-so-fantastic subject of insider trading. These politicians are all scumbags. So I want to at least lighten the mood and share with all of you Max Blumenthal's address to the U.N. Security Council. Now, again, uh, this took place. This is an article that came out from the Gray Zone uh, yesterday, June 29th. If you're not following the Gray Zone or Max Blumenthal or his team, please do so. They've been on the Jimmy Dore show and a few other uh, uh, independent media networks as well. Uh, they are award-winning journalists who have been speaking truth to power. And unfortunately, their voices are being silenced and they're being suppressed. And plus, they are also being threatened as well. Yes, that's happening in this day and age. Who would ever think under a Democratic administration, too, by the way? Let's pull up this video of the Gray Zone. And again, shout out to Max Blumenthal for speaking truth to power and trying to make sense in a world that is understandably going crazy. I now give the floor to Mr. Max Blumenthal. Thank you. And I thank uh, Alex Rubenstein and Wyatt Reed for helping me prepare this address. Wyatt Reed is a journalistic colleague of mine who in October 2022 happened to be in Donetsk when his hotel was shelled by the Ukrainian military with a 
apparently U.S. made howitzer nearly killing him. He was 100 meters away. I'm also here with my friend, the civil rights activist Randy Credico, who is more recently in Donetsk and witnessed regular HIMARS attacks on civilian targets. I am here not only as a journalist who spent over 20 years writing books, doing pr producing documentaries and writing articles about conflict and politics from several continents. I'm also here as an American taxpayer who's been dragooned into funding a proxy war that has become a threat to the regional and international stability at the expense of my countrymen and women. This June, just June 28th, as emergency crews work to clean up yet another toxic train derailment in the United States, this time on the Montana River, further exposing our nation's chronically underfunded infrastructure and its threats to our health, the Pentagon announced plans to send an additional $500 million worth of military aid to Ukraine. The development came as Ukraine's army enters the third week of a vaunted counteroffensive that CNN describes as, quote, not meeting expectations, and which even Vladimir Zelensky says is going slower than desired. As Ukraine's military. Uh, I, I don't mean to be interrupting Max Bloom at all. All right. I will be keeping my pausing to this video at, at a minimum. But this counteroffense, hell, this whole war, it needs to stop. Because I have a follow up video. If it doesn't stick the hairs on the back of your neck going up, I don't know what will. And if it doesn't frighten you, I don't know what to tell you. Because this war, the longer it goes on, the more I fear that it will escalate into something that we cannot crawl back away from. If there is to be a conflict where the nukes are flying, we are never again going to rebuild our civilization to this point. The survivors will envy the dead. And I dare not want to imagine what poor excuse humanity will look like in the aftermath of said conflict. He failed to breach Russia's primary defense line. CNN reported on June 12th that Kiev had lost, quote, lost 16 U.S. made armored vehicles sent to the country. So what did the Pentagon do? It simply passed that bill down to average U.S. taxpayers like myself, charging us another $325 million to replace Ukraine's squandered military stock. There was zero effort to consult the U.S. public's position on the matter, and the vast majority of Americans likely did not even know the exchange took place. This policy that I'm describing to you, which sees Washington prioritize unrestrained funding for a proxy war with a nuclear power in a foreign land where our while our domestic infrastructure falls apart before our eyes, exposes a disturbing dynamic at the heart of the Ukraine conflict an international Ponzi scheme that enables Western elites to seize hard-earned wealth from the hands of average U.S. citizens and funnel it into the coffers of a foreign government that even Transparency International ranks as consistently one of the most corrupt in Europe. The U.S. government has yet to conduct an official audit of its funding for Ukraine. The American public has no idea where their tax dollars are going. And that's why this week, we at the Gray Zone published an independent audit of U.S. Tox tax dollar allocation to Ukraine throughout the fiscal years 2022 and 23. Our investigation was led by Heather Kaiser, a former military intelligence officer who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. We found, among many bizarre payments, a $4.5 a $4 million payment from the U.S. Social Security Administration to the Kiev government. We found $4.5 billion worth of payments from the U.S. Agency for International Development to pay off Ukraine's sovereign debt, much of which is owned by the global investment firm BlackRock. That amounts to $30 taken from every U.S. citizen at a time when 4 in 10 Americans cannot afford a $400 emergency. We found tax dollars earmarked for Ukraine, padding the budgets of a television station in Toronto, a pro-NATO think tank in Poland, and believe it or not, even rural farmers in Kenya. We found tens of millions to private equity firms, including one in the Republic of Georgia, as well as a million dollar payment to a single private entrepreneur in Kiev. Our audit also revealed the Pentagon's $4.5 million contract with a company called Atlantic Diving Supply to provide Ukraine with unspecified explosives equipment. This is a notoriously corrupt company that none other than Tom Tillis, the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, previously lambasted for its, quote, history of fraud. Yet once again, Congress has failed to ensure these shady payments and massive arms deals are properly tracked. In fact, much of the military and humanitarian aid shipped to Ukraine has simply vanished. Last year, CBS News quoted the director of a pro-Zelensky nonprofit in Ukraine who reported that only 30% of aid was reaching the front lines. 
The embezzlement of funds and supplies is at least as troubling as the potential consequences of the illicit transfer and sales of military-grade weapons. Last June, the head of Interpol warned that the massive transfers of arms into Ukraine means, quote, we can expect an influx of weapons in Europe and beyond, and that criminals are now, as we speak, focusing on them. I also want to add into this <clears throat> that uh, it wasn't too long ago when no so fantastic CBS. That's right. Remember CBS way back in 2022? Who remembers that? Did a documentary on the weapons being shipped into Ukraine. They were told not to air it and take it down. Don't, don't. Don't bring up the fact that their weapons are not being accounted for. Plus, we also talked on our show, too, on how, oh, that's right, all the weapons that are being shipped to Ukraine, especially some of the heavy weapons and armor, they don't work properly. They're getting the hand-me-downs. What could possibly go wrong? This may a group of anti-Kremlin Russian exiles outfitted with gear supplied by the Ukrainian government was hailed by Western politicians for carrying out terrorist attacks in Russian territory using American-made Humvees. Although the group, the so-called Russian Volunteer Corps, is led by a man who calls himself the, quote, White King, and includes numerous open admirers of Adolf Hitler, described as neo-Nazis in U.S. mainstream media, the Western weaponization of this militia against Russian forces and Russian civilians has not prompted any outcry from Congress. And while the Biden administration has promised that it's keeping tabs on the weapons sent, a State Department cable leaked last December conceded that, quote, kinetic activity and active combat between Ukrainian and Russian forces create an environment in which standard verification measures are sometimes impracticable or impossible. The Biden administration not only knows that it cannot track the weapons it's shipping to Ukraine, it knows that it is escalating a proxy war against the world's largest nuclear power and daring it to respond in kind. We know this because back in 2014, and this timeline is so important, that's when NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said that the war started following a U.S.-backed coup d'etat. President Barack Obama rejected demands from Kiev to send lethal offensive weaponry because, as the Wall Street Journal put it, he had a, quote, long-standing concern that arming Ukraine would provoke Moscow into further escalation that would drag Washington into a proxy war. When Donald Trump entered office in 2017, he attempted to hold the line on Barack Obama's policy, but was soon branded a Russian puppet by the Beltway Press Corps and the Democratic Party for refusing to send Raytheon's Javelin missiles to the Ukrainian military. His reluctance to send the Javelins became a central theme of his impeachment, and he predictably relented. As U.S. made offensive weaponry began to reach the front lines of the Donbass, the collective West exploited the Minsk Accords to, quote, give Ukraine time to arm up, as the former German Chancellor Angela Merkel put it. In January 2022, the U.S. announced a $200 million arms package to Ukraine. Follow the timeline. By the 18th of February, observers from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe reported a doubling in ceasefire violations with OSCE maps showing the overwhelming majority of targeted sites on the side of pro-Russian separatists in Donetsk and Lugansk. Five days later, Russia invaded Ukraine. And since then, the U.S. and its allies have, have been scurrying up the escalation ladder at every opportunity. Quote, things we couldn't give in January because it was escalatory were given in February, a former State Department official complained after meeting with Ukrainian counterparts. And things we couldn't give in February, we can in April. That has been the distinct pattern, starting with, for crying out loud, stingers, referring to shoulder-mounted rockets. Joe Biden himself said in March 2022, the idea that we're going to send in offensive equipment and have planes and tanks, don't kid yourself. No matter what you all say, that's called World War III. Just over a year later, Biden changed his tune, backing a plan to provide F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine, and after pressuring Germany to send in the tanks he once feared would provoke World War III. Now, again, uh, the media, what is it doing in its oh-so-infamous ability to not read the room? They're sending out articles saying, oh, you don't have to worry about a small exchange between countries that might choose to launch their nukes. It's 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 not as bad as it sounds. Don't worry about it. Don't panic. Not to mention it's the same corporate media uh, earlier that was saying, hey, Ukraine, don't be showing those uh, Third Reich imagery. It's making it very difficult for us to lie for you. Or my personal favorite, 
Maybe it's a good idea we don't know what happened to the Nord Stream pipeline. Just shut up and stop asking questions. Just follow orders. Again, I want to keep my pausing to a minimum here because, again, what Max Bloom is all saying to the UN, you won't see this on MSNBC or CNN. Theoretically, you could see this being posted on Fox News, to be, to be fair. To be fair, all right, this is an endorsement of Fox News, but they'll do that. But they'll always have their own bias and agenda behind it. But the rest of the mainstream media, they won't talk about this. Think TYT is going to talk about this or Majority Report? How about uh, Crystal and Kyle? No, they're they're still reeling from the loss that uh, Marianne Williamson's campaign is effectively out of steam, to quote the Vanguard. It would only take two months from the time Ukraine received HIMARS, Lockheed made HIMARS systems for the U.S., for the for the Ukrainian military to begin targeting critical infrastructure, using them to strike the Antonovsky Bridge over the Dnipro River, and again, two months later, in a test strike on the Kohovka Dam to see if the Dnipro's water could be raised enough to stymie Russian crossings, as the Washington Post reported. Three weeks ago, the Kohovka Dam was destroyed, triggering a major environmental catastrophe that caused mass flooding and contamination of the local water supply. Ukraine, of course, blames Russia for this attack, but has produced no evidence. Around this time, Ukraine also baselessly accused Russia of planning a provocation at the Zaporozhia nuclear plant. This triggered a resolution by Senators Lindsey Graham and Richard Blumenthal, no relation to me, calling for NATO to intervene directly in Ukraine and attack Russia if such an incident occurred. The move by Blumenthal and Graham thus established a de facto red line for initiating U.S. military action, much like the one set down in Syria, which, as a former U.S. diplomat commented to journalist Charles Glass, was an open invitation to a false flag. Will we see another Duma deception, but this time in Zaporozhia? This time with nuclear consequences? Why are we doing this? Why are we tempting nuclear annihilation by flooding Ukraine with advanced weapons and sabotaging negotiations at every turn? We've been told by people like Senator Dick Durbin that Ukraine is literally in a battle for freedom and democracy itself. And he mentioned Dick Durbin, and let's face it, he's our also fantastic senator here in Illinois, and uh, he's the one that's quoted saying about the banks. They run this place. Well, gee, Dick, you know, the banks, corporations, your fantastic friends in Washington, D.C. are making a killing in insider trading, Dick. Hey, Dick. You gonna do anything about? Oh, I don't know. Maybe calling for I don't know a diplomatic envoy to have peace agreements so this war doesn't escalate further. Dick, I don't know. Dick, it's kind of risky to be a dick. Dick. Anyways, sorry. Got to add in some humor for this because let's face it, folks. We all know that uh, things are getting progressively worse, but it doesn't hurt to put a smile on people's faces and also making fun of a U.S. politician too. And therefore, anyone who opposes military aid to Ukraine opposes the very defense of democracy, according to this logic. So where's the democracy in Vladimir Zelensky's decision to ban opposition parties, to criminalize the media outlets of his legitimate political opponents, to jail his top political rival and his deputies, to raid Orthodox churches and jail clergymen? Where is the democracy in the Ukrainian government's imprisonment of Gonzalo Lira, an American citizen, simply for challenging the official narrative of Ukraine's war. And where is the democracy in Zelensky's recent decision to suspend elections in 2024 on the grounds that martial law has been declared? The answer is that Ukrainian democracy is harder to find these days than that country's commander in chief, Valery Zeluzhny. Senator Lindsey Graham has offered a much more grim and more on the mark rationale for supplying Ukraine with billions in weapons. As the Senator boasted during a recent visit with Zelensky in Kiev, the Russians are dying. It's the best money we've ever spent. I repeat, the Russians are dying. It's the best money we've ever spent. And Graham has also said that Americans are ready to fight this war down to the last Ukrainian. Oh, okay, well, uh, Lindsey Graham, you could speak for yourself, buddy. Uh, by the way, again, how crazy is it that Lindsey Graham is saying, you know, conservative, and hear me out, hear me out on this, saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're killing Russians, best money we could ever spend, right? And then you got Nikki Haley, who sounded like a possessed servant of the blood god corn. That's right. I had to throw in my 40K reference. Okay. But when Donald Trump, of all people, 
sounds like the most reasonable person in the room. I want people to stop dying. I want people to stop dying. It should tell you the state of American politics and where all of our politicians lie. Now, and now again, Trump, he could just be saying it and that's it. You know, I can follow through in actions and deeds are far more important and more valuable than words and statements. But Comparing to Graham, Nikki Haley, and Trump. <laughs> Trump is the most reasonable person. Who had that on your bingo card? Well, official casualty numbers are strictly classified. We must worry that Ukraine is well on its way to fulfilling the senator's ghoulish fantasies. As a Ukrainian con soldier complained this month to Vice News, we don't know what Zelensky's plans are, but, quote, it looks like the extermination of its own population like of the combat ready and working age population. That's it. Indeed, military cemeteries in Ukraine are expanding almost as rapidly as the Northern Virginia McMansions and beachfront estates of executives from Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and assorted Beltway contractors benefiting from the second highest level of military spending since World War II. These are the real winners of the Ukraine proxy war, not average Ukrainians or Americans or Russians, the winners or Europeans for that matter. The winners are people like Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who spent his time between the Obama and Biden administrations launching a consulting firm called West Exec Advisor which secured lucrative government contracts for intelligence firms in the arms industry. Blinken's former partners at West Exec include Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines, CIA Deputy Director David Cohen, former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, and almost a dozen current and former members of Biden's national security team. Defense Sec Secretary Lloyd Austin, for his part, is a former and possibly future member of board member of Raytheon and an ex-partner of Pine Island Capital Investment which collaborates with West Exec and which Blinken himself has advised. Meanwhile, the current U.S. ambassador to this body, the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, is listed as a senior counsel at the Albright Stonebridge Group, a self-described commercial diplomacy firm that also finesses government contracts for the intelligence and arms sector, and which was founded by Madeleine Albright, infamously known for her comments that the deaths by sanctions of half a million Iraqi children were worth it. So while military-aged Ukrainian men are ripped off the streets by military police and sent to the front lines, the financially and politically connected architects of this proxy war are planning to walk through the revolving door to reap unimaginable profits once their time in the Biden administration is over. For them, a negotiated settlement to this territorial dispute means an end to the cash cow of close to $150 billion in U.S. aid to Ukraine. So in closing, when the United States, my country, a permanent member of this council, has fallen under the control of a bipartisan regime which seeks to perpetuate a proxy war for as long as it takes, in the words of Joe Biden, which considers diplomacy synonymous with unilateral coercive measures to, quote, turn the ruble to rubble, as Biden pledged to do, whose leadership subverts negotiations in order to pursue profit while refusing to properly its, inform its own citizens what they're paying for and pushes the sons and brothers of its supposed Ukrainian partners out onto a killing field in order to bludgeon a geopolitical rival. When both Zelensky and members of US Congress are calling for preemptive strikes on Russia, which have nothing to do with Article 51 of the UN Charter, this council must take action to enforce that charter. That charter is clear that the Security Council must use its authority to guarantee a Pacific settlement of dispute, particularly when it threatens international security. That should not only apply to Russia and Ukraine. This council has an obligation to strictly monitor and restrain the U.S. and the illegal military formation known as NATO. Thank you. Again, that's Max Blumenthal, folks. I didn't want to interrupt too much. Because, again, I think it's important for all of you to hear this, especially as you head to work or if it's your day off or if you're coming home from work. You need to know what's happening uh, here in the United States, especially in regards towards what our also oh fantastic politicians are allowing to continue on. But we need to know just how devastating a conflict could be. Now, again, this is just a video simulation of what one looks like if the big brain idiots who are our politicians, and this goes to politicians worldwide, decide to push that shiny red button and play with our lives. There's nothing humorous about this. We're being ruled over by sociopaths. This is what it would look like. What would happen if there was a full-scale nuclear war between Russia and the United States? Based on non-classified data, the aftermath might go something like this. When one side launches nuclear missiles, 
the other side detects them and fires back before impact. U.S. submarine-launched ballistic missiles from west of Norway start striking Russia after about 10 minutes, and Russian ones from north of Canada start hitting the U.S. a few minutes later. The very first strikes are high-altitude EMP attacks, frying electronics and power grids, by creating an electromagnetic pulse of tens of thousands of volts per meter. The next strikes target command and control, as well as nuclear launch facilities. Land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles take about half an hour to arrive. Major cities are targeted, both because they contain military facilities and to stymie the enemy's post-war recovery. Some cruise missiles take hours to reach their target. Each impact creates a fireball about as hot as the core of the sun, followed by a radioactive mushroom cloud. These intense explosions vaporize people nearby and cause fires and blindness further away. The fireball expansion then causes a blast wave that damages buildings, crushing nearby ones. The United Kingdom and France have nuclear capabilities and are obliged by NATO's Article 5 to defend the U.S. So, Russia hits them too. Firestorms engulf many cities, where storm-level winds fan the flames, igniting anything that can burn, melting glass and some metals, and turning asphalt into flammable hot liquid. But the explosions, the electromagnetic pulse, and the radioactivity aren't the worst part nuclear winter is, caused by the black carbon smoke from the nuclear firestorms. The Hiroshima atomic bomb caused such a firestorm, but today's hydrogen bombs are much more powerful. A large city like Moscow, with almost 50 times more people, can create much more smoke. And a firestorm sends plumes of black smoke up into the stratosphere, far above any rain clouds that would otherwise wash out the smoke. This black smoke gets heated by sunlight, lofting it like a hot air balloon for up to a decade. High altitude jet streams are so fast that it takes only a few days for the smoke to spread across much of the northern hemisphere. In the meantime, Earth gets freezing cold even during the summer, with farmland in Kansas cooling by about 20 degrees centigrade or 40 degrees Fahrenheit and other regions cooling almost twice as much. A recent scientific paper estimates that over 5 billion people could starve to death, including around 99% of those in the United States, Europe, Russia, and China. We obviously don't know how many people will survive a nuclear war. But if it's even remotely as bad as scientists think, then it has no winners, merely losers. It's easy to feel powerless, but the good news is that there is something you can do to help. Please share this video, because the more people know about nuclear war, the less likely it is that we'll start one. And folks, we need, we need to do everything we can to hopefully end and call out and start vo voicing out why we need to end this war that's happening in Ukraine. Look, these nukes, these weapons of mass destruction are pointed at each other. And so while you have also fantastic people like Greta going over there to Ukraine and having a little photo op with Zelensky, to me, what this is, is just a continuation of madness and stupidity. We have to be better. We have to be smarter. We have to start treating each other with respect. And more importantly, we have to end money in politics because the military industrial complex, big oil are buying off our politicians. So people like Dick Durbin, Lindsey Graham, or any of these other sickle fans get to once again, play with people's lives all the while ignoring the fact here in our own country, people are starving. People are struggling. We have to fight for a better future, not only for ourselves, but for the next generation An endless forever war is not the answer.